Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this Sassy Week session on women in technology or more specifically women in cyber. I'm your host Emily Wearmouth. I'm joined today by two brilliant women in cyber so I'm going to start with some introductions. First of all I'm really pleased that Emily Heath has joined us today. Two Emilies are always better than one and this Emily has a fascinating cyber career starting off when she was a detective in the fraud squad with the UK police. She then went on to hold VP and CISO roles for the likes of United Airlines and DocuSign. Currently, Emily serves on the board of directors for a number of public and private organisations. Thank you for joining us, Emily. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. My other guest has an equally impressive CV or resume to talk American. Shamla Naidu has served as a CISO for the likes of Starwood Resorts and IBM and is also an adjunct professor of law at the University of Illinois. She serves as a board member or independent director for multiple public boards, and she's also head of cloud strategy and innovation at Netscope. And I'll be honest, I'm pretty intimidated right now. Welcome, Shamla. Thank you for having me, Emily. I jumped at the opportunity to host this session today because personally, I find it frustrating that so many women in tech conversations are sort of self-help sessions. And I wanted to pick the brains of you two as very successful female leaders in our industry and ask you some really genuinely challenging questions. Are you both up for that? I think we're always up for it. Shamar and I are always up for this topic. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Excellent. Well, I'll dive right in. For a bit of context, recent government figures show that the percentage of women in cybersecurity roles in the UK dropped by almost a quarter over the last two years, from 22% to just 17%. And the UK is not alone in its struggles really to make an impact, with the sector continuing to entice and retain men more successfully than women. But we also know from other research that diverse teams drive better business outcomes. There have been lots of long range research programs that show higher levels of gender diversity on the likes of FTSE uh, 350 boards positively correlate with financial performance. So I wanted to start by asking you both, What's your general initial reaction to such stark figures coming out of the UK government? Well, I'm happy to start. Uh, I'm actually shocked. I'm surprised that the numbers have gone down for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, I think both Shambo and I, we're out in the community a lot with fellow CISOs and, and women are always underrepresented. There's no doubt. It's always a sea of men. But um, I thought we were starting to see more women in cybersecurity, in particular in leadership roles. Now, perhaps that what that indicates is the investment in, in uh, focus that we've had on bringing women into cyber perhaps started a few years ago, and now those women are getting into more uh, high-level leadership roles. But I'm surprised at the numbers because uh, I do see more women, but, but albeit they're probably more in leadership roles than they are in some of the, the management layers and, uh, and some of the other layers of security. So it, it worries me greatly because if, it, if we're not spending the time investing in making sure that women are represented at every level of an organization, then we're going to be in stark danger of not having more women in leadership roles in the future. So my initial reaction was like, wow, I, I'm actually shocked. I thought we were getting somewhere. What about you, Shamla? So, so, Emily, I will say that I am not surprised at all by those numbers. Um, you know, I think Emily is right. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've seen those numbers increase, and that was very good news. It was a really good sign of the industry kind of changing and becoming a little bit more friendly toward women. Um, and so we got some better numbers. However, remember, we also got those better numbers because we started counting differently. So rather than looking for kind of pure cybersecurity skills and then adding that, we started to become a little bit more generic. And so those numbers included things like technology leaders. And so, you know, while it's arguable whether they in or they out, I think those numbers were a little bit artificial simply because some of that increase was due to us counting differently. But the second thing that I think is more important is that over the last couple of years, we've seen a significant increase in mental health strain and stress, I think, on the whole industry. But for women in particular, you know that, you know, we react more quickly 
and we react more seriously to those kinds of challenges. And the job has become more stressful. The job has become almost impossible to sustain. And so I am not surprised at all that women are beginning to leave this field. And so those two things to me, given that those things were happening, does not surprise me at all that the numbers are, are getting lower. Although very, very sad news. The other, the other thing I wonder is, um, you know, we all know that changing these archaic norms of having such a low percentage of women over the years, we need our male allies in this too, right? We need male allies in order to help change those statistics and change those norms. And it takes a lot of focus and discipline to be able to do that. It doesn't just happen on its own. And I wonder whether for some of those impacts, mental health impacts, have been, we've been through COVID, it's life changed and turned upside down uh, over the last few years. I wonder whether the focus and discipline that we had in making sure that cyber teams were well represented in every kind of diversity has, uh, for all the wrong reasons, taken a lower priority. I wonder whether that's the case too. And, and that again, that worries me. There has to be a genuine intent to change these archaic norms. It, it's not just something you tack on to the end of a conversation. And I, I wonder whether some of those mental health uh, challenges, which I think are very real uh, for both the male and the female um, uh, folks in, in business, but I wonder whether that's got anything to do with it too. But yeah, you make a great point. Yeah, I've seen some suggestions that um, women were hit hardest by industry layoffs um, or that um, when times got a bit trickier in recent years, um, the focus on diversity initiatives went out the window where people focused on sort of harder issues around, you know, business risk and business challenges. And these initiatives that were perhaps seen as a bit fluffy, nice to have went out of the window when push comes to shove. And so I wonder how, how, if that is the case, how can we challenge that notion that women in cyber is a non-essential sideline project and really assert it's business critical? You know, Emily, I think you kind of started out by saying in many ways, this has been kind of a self-help kind of program, right? Where you, you give women a book, you say, read this book or read this article or go to this class or, you know, learn this material. Well, leave we, is to think differently about that. We need to think more about this field as a apprenticeship type program. Somebody needs to hold your hand through these types of learnings. You know, if, if it was that easy, we would all read a book and we would, we would gain the knowledge. It's not that easy. We know it. Emily and I know it from having been there and done that. And so, you know, I think we need to think differently about these programs. This cannot be a self-help program. This has to be one of those, hold my hand and lead me through this in order to, to teach me so that I become more important, more relevant, more valuable. And when those layoffs show up, I'm not the first one you lay off, which, you know, if you think about it, I mean, historically, women have come into the cyber field, but in disproportionate numbers, they take on jobs of policy and governance and testing and, you know, a lot of the kind of the administrative side of the job which in hard times can often seem like they're less important or less valuable. And that's why women are disproportionately impacted by these layoffs. So, you know, even that doesn't surprise me at all. What surprises me, though, is this idea that, you know, women are generally not technical enough. Perhaps we're not bringing as much value into the teams because we are not bringing in those hardcore technical skills. And that's not quite true. I completely agree with you, Shamla. I mean, you know, just a... Uh, on a personal note, I have been told more than once that I, by, by men, white men on both occasions, that I got the jobs that I got because I was a woman. And um, to which I say, um, good, it's our time. You know what? If it opens a window this much because I'm a female, I make no apology for that whatsoever. And if it means that I get a chance and an opportunity of a job because I'm a female, nobody's going to give me the job if I'm not qualified for the job. So if it opens a little crack in the window, I say bolt through that window and push that door down because, you know what, it's our time. And um, I've never spoken to either one of those white men since that conversation, as I'm sure you can imagine. But um, 
I think I'm hopeful that we've gotten away from that level of thinking these days. Uh, that was a number of years ago. But still, it's still shocking that somebody would actually say that out loud, that you know you only got that position because you're a female. Um, and as women, this is this is what many women put up with in these corporate positions. But at every layer of an organization, if we're experiencing that at our level of an organization, can you imagine what women at other levels of organizations are, are, are feeling? And this is why I talk about it publicly, because I think it's really important. I think it's important that we acknowledge that, yes, it's tough sometimes, and we do have some of these very challenging situations to get through. But the way we overcome it is, you know, to Shamla's point earlier, it's not just about hiring people for their titles. You've got to hire people for their skill sets. And when you start to think about hiring from skill sets, you, you open up a whole new world for yourself. And uh, I've seen this work incredibly well at different organizations over the years. And it's a mind shift to think about bringing people into your team that doesn't necessarily have pure cyber experience, but they've got damn good experience and skill sets that you need to contribute to your team. At the end of the day, smart people can learn stuff. Shamala and I did not start our journeys in the corporate world thinking that we were going to be chief security officers. That job didn't exist back then. But smart people can learn things. We all learn things along the way, but we need to be given the opportunity. And if you're given the opportunity for, uh, because you're a woman, own it and say, yes, thank you. I take it with open arms and I will plow through that door and I will prove to you why you made the right decision. I absolutely and love Emily, that. You know what I would add to that is um, maybe one gets the job because you're a woman, but you don't keep the job because you're a woman. Yeah, like, exactly. Keep the because we are competent. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and uh, th there was a mention of white men in there, and I know Shamila, you, you've got some thoughts as well about how gender isn't the only diversity issue that we need to be bearing in mind with these conversations. You know, as I was kind of thinking about this conversation, one of the things that's striking to me is, you know, we talk about gender, we talk about males and females, and gender has gotten more fluid in more recent years. And so that's a challenge we really have to face. But more importantly, I think there's another aspect to this conversation that needs to be included. If you look at the numbers that you cited, I'm not sure that we actually are calculating or giving visibility to the challenge that women of color and black women in particular face in this area. So if I give you an example, you know, in the U.S. over the last three years, um, three to five years, I would say the number of women in cybersecurity in particular has increased. Um, like I talked about earlier, some of it is because we counted differently. But frankly, I think, you know, a, a number of uh, women have been hired into leadership roles and into the field. So that number is getting better. But if you just think that the number is now about 27% of women um, hold those roles, then out of that, about 3% of those women are black women. And so they have an even more difficult time. You think, you know, we have a challenge of kind of, you know, getting to better numbers, getting to higher level roles, et cetera us black women are having a much harder time. And so we really need to wrestle with that as well. Because if we think about being inclusive, it's not just being the gender inclusive, it's within the gender, there are categories of metrics and other goals that we need to be setting because there are you know, other factors that actually make us more effective. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to ask you both a really mean question, um, and I don't often ask a question that I don't know that there's, whether there's an answer to, but I'm just going to do it. Um, I w I'm wondering, I said at the beginning about these FTSE 350 piece of research, it was a, a longitudinal study from some like 2001 to about 2019. And so over that period of time, there's been a general belief in the figures that it helps business outcomes to increase diversity. Where could we look for similar sorts of numbers for cybersecurity that perhaps play on things like a correlation between diversity and risk profile? You know, what, what should we be looking at under the bonnet that we can throw it in the faces of our detractors and say, look, it's worth doing? Yeah, it's a really tough one because cyber in particular, people don't share their metrics very often around success in, in the ways that they would do around other lines of business. So we're really limited 
in terms of what we can what we can track as 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 metrics that we can report on. But I think for me, and I've seen this, I've tried and tested this many times in in my organizations and hired uh, incredibly diverse, creative sets of people. Diversity meaning from every walk of life, diversity of mind, diversity of thought, and yes, gender and race as well. And um, when you have an organization that operates in a way that is represents the world and not just represents historic corporate America, um, things change. It's really hard to put your finger on exactly what changes, but it's I've seen it in action. It's like magic when it works. There's almost this freedom that people feel. There's an equality that people feel. There's a different camaraderie and spirit, and people run toward you instead of away from you. And so um, I've been very blessed through, from my previous teams that um, I'm no longer an operating CISO, but when I was, my, my previous teams had a very, very low attrition rates. And I attribute that to, to the value that the entire team put together. It's nothing to do with me. It's not to do with me personally. It's to do with the spirit and the energy that the entire team put into creating an organization that really walk the walk and really meaningfully and genuinely want to represent how the world looks. And like I said at the very beginning, it takes time, it takes focus, it takes discipline. Um, but attrition rates being exceptionally low. I, in my old previous organizations, my, my attrition rate was so low compared to some of the other groups that HR teams want to know what's What's wrong with my group? It's, there's nothing wrong. People are happy. People are happy because they see representation and, and people have never had a problem hiring people because, you know, part of being a leader, it's our job to get out there and talk about why this matters to us so much. And when you have those truly dynamic, engaging, creative uh, teams, because they are so diverse, the attrition rates are really low. Um, but the success of cyber is really difficult to, to, to measure uh, in and of itself because most people don't really share that information. You could probably have some measure internally, uh, but it's really hard outside of, um, I would say, general HR statistics. So, you know, Emily, the way you ask the question like evokes for me a reaction, which is, you know, your question presupposes that the information exists somewhere and we could just lift off the covers and pull it out. <laughs> and, and that's not true, right? But why is it not true? We don't collect information and report on information that we think doesn't reflect well on us, right? We, most organizations are going to bring out data that doesn't put them in good light in the industry. So it's hard to say collect the data because at some point if they collect it, that means they have to admit that there's something they have to do, something is not working. And so to me, I think, you know, a lot of this never gets collected. And so you're not going to find it, but let's just take some examples, right? So if I think about revenue per employee, we know how to calculate that. Every company knows how to calculate that. Why? Because revenue is a publicly available number. You have to report it. So everyone knows what your revenue is and everyone typically knows what your employee count is. So revenue by employee is an easy metric. It's an easy one for us to calculate. Also, if we didn't calculate it, others can. And so we need to think about diversity and these kinds of metrics in similar ways is, you know, how do you make that information public? How do you create disclosure that is equitable? So it's not just one company who's, who's reporting it because they have good numbers to report. And so they go out there and tout their numbers. But how do you make that a requirement across the board so that everyone is looking at this from the same lens? And, and so good and bad is then in the eye of the investor or in the eye of the, of the you know, receiver of this information. I feel like we need to be thinking about this a little bit differently. It's not to punish anyone, but it's to create equity in, in how we might view the data. And then as consumers, we make our own decisions. Yeah, I think that's a great point, actually, because and I think we're starting to see this a little bit with some of the ESG initiatives. Uh, now, a lot more companies are a lot more... Um, a lot more likely to publicly disclose their diversity statistics, for example, than they ever used to be before. A lot of them now are on their public websites as a result of the pressure 
that they're seeing from the investor community and from Wall Street and uh, around making sure that, that ESG initiatives are not greenwashing, are not lip service, that somebody actually is truly, again, I say there has to be a genuine intent to change. You can't, you cannot whitewash, like greenwash any of this. You just can't. It's, it's got to be a genuine intent. But, um, but you're right. Some of, some of that, some of those statistics externally uh, have not historically been available. Hopefully we'll start to see that a little bit more as these initiatives start to grow. Maybe we need an industry task force. Well, you could you could get an industry task force or you could do, you know, what I think is kind of happening organically. And being on multiple public company boards, you know, Emily and I both know this. When the board starts to pay attention to the topic, and in the U.S. in particular, they have started paying attention to, you know, ESG type initiatives. When they get involved, people magically show up with the data because they are now overseeing it. And they're going to expect someone to come and report. And in order for a CEO to report that information, they better be collecting it. And more importantly, they better show that they have a, um, you know, a pattern of getting the numbers to improve over time. And so I think that that's creating a little bit of organic pressure. Of course, you know, it's not a, it's not a mandate by any means, but certainly when your board starts talking about it, the CEO pays attention. And when they pay attention, usually that impacts culture. And then across yeah. the board, you end up with this kind of cultural change of, okay, let's, let's think harder about it. And it shouldn't just be a paper-based exercise or just words on, on a piece of paper. It should actually be, you know, complemented with action, investment, and then results. That ties into uh, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you. And I know, Shamali, you've just published a book all about the cyber savvy board. Um, and we're, we're having conversations that sort of all meet at this point in the middle. We, we know that ESG is growing in importance for boards. We know that cyber conversations and discussions around risk are growing in importance for boards. How do we bring these threads all together? And also, a sort of a second part to that question, is the board level where we need to be having these conversations or does it need to be had at an executive level or a manager level or all three? So let me just start by saying, you know, boards need to have a basic understanding of what really goes on, right? Um, one of the things you've heard talked about in the last decade has been that we don't have enough skills in the cyber field to do what we need to do. And that really is frustrating to me because you know, you've got a whole body of expertise, you've got you know, people who are interested, you have people who can be taught, you have people who want uh, careers in this field. And so we've got that group of people, including women and people of color, et cetera. And on the other side, businesses say, I don't have enough skills, I don't have enough people to do the job, to do the cybersecurity job. Well, why not bring those two things together and figure out models that actually solve for the problem rather than saying, well, we don't have enough skills. Well, go build the skills. Don't expect to just buy it, figure out ways to go build it. And that's how you become more inclusive. You know, you asked earlier, Emily, about um, how, you know, how do we kind of measure this, right? And how do we show that uh, having a diverse workforce in cybersecurity in particular adds more value? Well, we know from scientific research that when groups of team and teams of people include both genders, males and females, and now, you know, any other gender identification, that they naturally take more risk. Companies make money because they take more risk. And that, and so this just fits naturally into that equation. So even if you're not able to calculate it today, if you believe the science, then you know that having diverse teams are gonna help you take more risk. When you take more risk, you're likely to make more money or you're likely to fail more quickly and more people are gonna be aware of it and stop you, stop the bleeding. So you know, we need to be thinking about this from a workforce perspective, this is not just a check the box exercise, put more women in or put more people of color in, but it's like solve a real business problem, build more skills. And these people are there, they're available. Why don't we take them and fill the, the opportunity and the openness that we find in businesses? Emily, did you have any thoughts then? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and it's uh, within the cybersecurity realms, of course, we're, we're already in a situation where we have a lack of diversity in cyber as a subset uh, of, a, of a corporate environment. 
as you start talking about where the change happens, the change always happens at the top and, and every other layer, in my opinion. It has to take every layer of an organization to really, truly shift change. But you need people at the top of the organization who represent that change. Because the rest of an organization, if they see an all-white board or all-white male board uh, and then people talking about the initiatives around diversity, that's not walking the walk. It's not believable. It doesn't come across as genuine and it's, uh, it needs to be represented at every layer of the company. The challenge we have is how do we get, and I'm talking specifically around cyber, how do we get women and people of color in cyber into the public boardroom? Because many, many security executives want to be in the public boardroom, but they don't necessarily have the full experience that they need to do that. The first thing that they need to do is uh, corporations need to give chief security officers uh, the ability to contribute at every level of an organization, meaning they need to truly be C-suite. We need to stop messing around with reporting structures. Security officers are business leaders first and security leaders second. This is technology and security has become way too big of a, an impact on most organizations now that we need to give them the experience to operate in the C-suite so that they have experience beyond security as to how an organization actually operates, what drives revenue, and have them contribute to that. At that level, then they will be better situated in order to get onto public boards. Uh, because if you think about it, public boards have somewhere between nine and 12 seats. And when it comes to the topic of cybersecurity, security officers usually only have about 20, 30 minutes in front of an audit committee or sometimes the full board to talk about cybersecurity. But boards of directors could be a day and a half, two days long. So what else are the board talking about? And so how do we equip our security officers with the ability to be able to contribute beyond just the security conversation in a public boardroom. And I, and I think this conversation has to start with, we have to elevate this position. Uh, otherwise we're going to have a major supply and demand problem. We're gonna have high demand for security expertise uh, on public boards, including women and people of color, um, but the supply is going to be way too short. So we need to solve this problem now by allowing security officers uh, the opportunity to learn and uh, be a part of the, the conversation at the C-suite. Thank you. Well, before we wrap up, any final thoughts or takeaways from either of you? The one final takeaway for me from this conversation is, you know, we need to really get a little introspective and think about, have we as a cybersecurity industry become too elite? Have we become too elite to allow women and people of color into our area of, of expertise and into this field? You know, is there a certain amount of arrogance that has crept into this field that says, those of us who are women and those of us who are people of color don't belong or we don't know enough or we're not competent enough to be in this area. I feel like that's a conversation we need to have and it's something that we need to really go in and dig deeper and inspect in our own decision making. What are we doing to be inclusive and are we actually finding ourselves in this kind of situation where we feel like we better than others? Yeah, and for me, I'll, I'll keep it simple. But for me, I think it's, um, I've said it many times, many times, you have to have a genuine desire to shift archaic norms. It does not happen overnight and it doesn't happen without focus, discipline, and a genuine, authentic heart to be able to want to change this industry for the better. And if you, you have good intentions and you have that uh, authenticity uh, about you, people will run toward you. Um, people want to belong to teams whether that's a board or whether it's a C-suite or whether it's a cyber team, people want to belong to teams that care deeply about diversity and about creativity and inclusion. Leaders have to have it in their heart to drive this topic forward or else we're never going to get rid of those archaic norms. And on top of that, you say you have a skill shortage. It is our responsibility to, to solve for the skill shortage. This is a simple, easy answer. <laughs> 
just as I suspected it might be, this conversation is absolutely fascinating and I would love it to continue forever. I really just wanted to thank you both for joining us today to talk about this topic. I think it's incredibly important and hopefully the conversation will continue beyond uh, this short window of time. Um, I hope others have found it as interesting to listen to as I have. Um, if you have been listening and you enjoyed this session, please do check out some of our other excellent online events that are happening this week as part of Netscope's Sassy Week. Thank you both for your time.